Yeah, giddy up. Congressman, good to see you. It's been a while. Good to see you. Yeah, no, I've, I, I see you on, in social media. It seems like a little bit more than personally. We've got to change that. This is great to be here. Yeah, it's uh, this has been the weirdest 2021 I've ever lived through, and I'm, I'm sort of pining for the normal days of 2020 at this point. I mean, you know, when people were joking about, uh, you know, to, uh, to 2021 that, uh, you know, hold my beer, right, with 2020, yeah. it's, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've definitely stepped on it. Look, I still remain uh, optimistic that we'll kind of turn a corner here, but, uh, but we've got a lot of work to do if we're going to do it. So. Uh, I'm always optimistic, and I think that's why both of us do what we do, because uh, things – things can always get better, yeah. particularly when things things are really bad. But um, you, you were talking a little bit before we went live about the experience in the safe room at the Capitol. And I should point out for everyone watching this, we're taping the day after the violence at the Capitol. So you're, first of all, you haven't had any sleep. So if you say something really stupid, we won't hold you totally accountable. Well, if I say something really stupid, it'll just be a normal day. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's if it's if it's unintelligible, then please forgive me, because yeah, we've had pretty much a, a, a lack of sleep. Uh, yeah. It's been look, it's been it's been an intense few days, and you know, it, it's not it's not surprising in a sense. And you know, I used a phrase on Monday night. I did an interview with Tucker on on uh, Fox, and we were talking through some of the issues, and then heading into Georgia, and and. You know, he was just asking about what kind of led us there. And, and um, you know, I made the point that we were, I used the phrase that we were in a cold civil war. And uh, some are obviously going to now try to view that as being part of the, I don't know, in, you know, increasing the temperature. And in, fr- in fact, it's, it, it's kind of just a recognition of the reality of what we're feeling in this country, right? And, and uh, it, it's cold. But obviously, on Wednesday, we saw some of some of the the heat from that, I and mean, we can talk about what what caused some of that and so forth. But the bottom line is, we have some deep divisions, and we have American people who are frustrated, and understandably, we have small businesses shut down, people's livelihoods they've invested in, and they're not able to go carry out their lifelong dream of owning a restaurant or a coffee shop, and they're 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 mad. And a lot of that has bubbled up in a number of different ways over the last year or two. And then we saw it get really intense on Wednesday. It was unfortunate. It was wrong. People shouldn't have stormed in and broken into the Capitol. The, um, and I wish the president hadn't spun up people uh, in many of the ways that, that, that occurred in the, in the preceding weeks. But uh, the republic shall endure. And we went back and we did our job on the floor of the House, and I'm glad we did. Well, you and uh, I, I believe it was your letter, your instigation, but correct me, you and Thomas Massey and Nancy Mace and I believe three other members wrote a letter which was really a letter to America and, and not a letter to, to any official explaining what you were going to do and why you were doing it in terms of electors uh, before anything bad happened. Was that, was that on purpose? Yes, it was. We, we had been discussing over the preceding days uh, what we should do and how we should express what we had come to realize we, sh- we shared. Uh, in views about the uh, acceptance or non-acceptance of the electors, so yeah, you're right. It was Congressman Massey and and uh, and and uh, Mace and and uh, Buck, myself, uh, McClintock, um, and I'm probably forgetting one or two. But and so we we put this letter out in in essence saying, well, we we believe in the Twelfth Amendment to the United States Constitution, and we believe that it amends the Constitution. Uh, in in whole, with the with the result of, of of the simple fact that we're supposed to count the electors, and it is an important piece of the fabric of our country, because it reflects the very union that that began this republic when states came together, and it respects the fact that those states choose the presidential electors, and if you turn that on its head, and if you empower Congress to do the choosing, then you fundamentally alter the bargain. You fundamentally alter that core founding principle where these states came together in union. Now, there's a lot of variables in all of that I recognize, but our belief was strong that this is fundamental. And no matter what you think about what happened in various states, no matter what your belief is about problems in the election system, and look, some of those are real, some of those are overblown. We could have a whole episode on that. But no matter what you believe on that, fundamentally the states and the electors and our job is to count. And it and it's a really important moment. I was proud to be in the House chamber when the Vice President of the United States carried out his solemn duty under in his oath to defend the Constitution, 
by opening those electors, finishing the job, and we uh, approved the electors and moved forward. And and this principle, this fundamental principle of federalism, is something that uh, we used to preach in the Tea Party days. Federalism was was part of our civic religion, and have we lost that? Do people not care about federalism anymore? Well, I still think it's fundamental to who we are, and people get it when they think about why they live in certain places and where they want to live and, you know, a choice to live in Texas or Montana or someplace versus, say, New York or California or vice versa. Uh, I think I'm, it's, I've applied for honorary citizenship in Texas, just the Republic of Texas, just in case uh, things in D.C. <laughs> go horribly wrong. Well, we, we will be we'd be honored to have you, of course. And I think Texas 21 is a particularly good spot. And we <laughs> welcome you in the Hill Country. And uh, look, I think it's a part of our ethos. It's part of who we are as Americans, but not everybody gets it or thinks about it. Not everybody nerds out reading the Federalist Papers like we might. Not everybody goes and studies that history. Uh, but they do understand it, right? They understand that our, our nation was built on these ideas where we have communities, we have people with shared ideals. And you start ripping apart the fabric of America if you're forcing everybody uh, to, to accept one-size-fits-all type solutions from faraway powers, Right. Federalism respects those differences, allowing us to unite for common defense and unite for economic strength and security, while allowing us to live peaceably apart with different views and ideals. If we do not accept that, if we do not embrace those founding core principles, then I do not have an optimistic view of the future of the country because yeah. we unite through that federalism. Yeah. That, that's the path to unity. You know, I was uh, thinking about this in the context of, of your phrase, a cold civil war a good friend of this show and a good friend of ours, Senator Mike Lee, has argued that, that federalism is the only way to defuse the bomb because it was designed by the founders to protect us from, from destroying each other because what you want to do in Texas may not be the same as what uh, people in Utah want to do and or people in D.C. Um, maybe a bad example because we're, we're unique, but um, the states... And, and I would argue as a libertarian, communities. Right. Communities should have that power. Right. And I'm not even sure I would want that, the, the state to have that much power. Um, but what you did that potentially upset so many Trump voters mm -hmm. was really a defense of a system that ultimately allows them to live their lives as they choose instead of what President Biden will want them to live. And that's, that's pretty core. That's exactly right. That was certainly the intent. And, and I have been um, warmed by the amount of, of uh, incoming feedback in terms of mail and email and phone calls from people across the spectrum uh, thanking me and thanking my staff and thanking Congressman Massey and my colleagues that stood on, on that principle, those who get it. And I think there are many more who get it than who don't. And, you know, yes, people were understandably frustrated about, you know, uh, some of the things they saw with respect to our elections and, um, and, and other things. And I also, let me just take a moment to say, I think that some of the frustration about the elections is actually proxy for bigger frustrations. Not to say those aren't enormously important, but they're proxy for all of those other underlying issues in which people feel like they're being told how to live their lives and unable to live their lives freely and according to the ways they want to a family in my district who wants to educate their children in an environment that respects the United States, teaches them core Western civilization values, um, honors their faith, whatever it might be, and they can't in the public school system. They're just prohibited from being able to do that. But yet they're paying taxes for the privilege to educate their children in a way they don't want to. They're frustrated about that. They can't afford to have a parent stay home at homeschool or they can't afford to send a child to private school. That's central to their existence. Yeah. Their business is now shut down because a local tyrannical government comes in and just declares you will be shut down. And that same local government will do nothing, by the way, Matt, to make them whole for that taking of their livelihood. They will do nothing. They will look to Washington and say, write another blank check, mortgaging the future of our children and grandchildren. And the people see that and they're angry. And you know what? So am I. I'm really angry about that. But we as statesmen in this town, as godforsaken as this town might be at times, we have a duty to stand on that Constitution and to stand up and say, this Constitution affords us the way to unite together. Let's go fight for it. And let's fight for it now.
It's kind of it's kind of remarkable to me, and and I want to talk about violence, and I am a an absolutist, um, pro peaceful protesting, anti violent protesting guy, and I want to talk about that. But mm-hmm. um, the context of this, as you just pointed out, and you've been very vocal on this, and and unfortunately, not that many members of Congress have about these arbitrary lockdowns and and the arbitrary takings of people's livelihoods, right. and those those two things, parents. Um, uh, public schools refuse to open, not because anyone cares about the children, but right. because um, the unions are more interested in their well-being as opposed to right. to your children. Um, shutting down business and bars and arbitrarily saying this person's essential, this person is not essential, which means they're worthless, right? Um, and the, it's it's surprising to me that this tinderbox hasn't exploded before. Like, what are we doing? It's insane that we would ask the American people why the entire Washington class is well-fed, uh, there's been no layoffs, there's been nobody worrying about their jobs in my town, Washington, D.C., um, I get the frustration. No, and I, and some two thoughts come to mind. I mean, and one is uh, that I think the American people are a strong, generally peaceable people who want to be able to agree to disagree. I do think that the vast majority of American people, they feel that way. They do not want to be in your business. They do not want to be telling you what to do. They want to live their lives according to the dictates of their conscience, and they want to be left alone to do so. That is part of our American DNA to the extent you can say we have something like that, right? Even though we're a nation of laws and ideas and not a particular bloodline, but in terms it, of— It's an ethos. But it's an ethos. It's who we are. The second thing I would observe— and I don't want to spiral too far down this path unless you do, is that I think a fundamental problem we have is a federal government that has an unlimited, it thinks, this is not true, but an unlimited blank check. And the problem with that is not just the $28 trillion of debt that's barreling to well over $30 trillion. That is a massive problem, destabilizing our economy and our currency and all those things that we could do a whole episode on. But it goes to the heart of a government that then has unlimited power it ha- because it can do whatever it wants to do. And then we ne- it, there's no check. If the federal government had to stop before it wrote another check, then it, 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 it would have to make a choice, right? It would have to choose between Social Security and Medicare dollars and writing another check to uh, fund keeping businesses open, even though they're not in the, in the, in the heat of a pandemic by making decisions on that. They'd have to choose, uh, you know, which policies they're going to enforce on schools when they're dumping $50 billion and saying, here's how you're going to do it. We know we never do that. We never have to sit at a kitchen table and make a tough choice. Like you do, mm-hmm. like a small business does literally ever. And therefore we are ripping apart the fabric of our nation with checks. They're going to be our undoing if we don't stop it. Yeah. It's, it's you know the the my progressive friends worry a lot about haves and have nots, mm-hmm. and I think particularly during the lockdown, but I think this was true long before the lockdown. There there is a political class, and it's all the the lobbyists and crony capitalists and oh. and power mongers and bureaucrats. You know people that can't be fired. Um, there there is that tension, and I think I think that's why sometimes you see populist crossover between some of the Bernie Bros. Uh, some of the Trump protesters, Ron Paul, uh, the Tea Party. There's there's a lot of anxiety about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the question is, what do we do about it? And I, and I, and I want to start, because I want to sure. give people some hope and yeah. some optimism. And, and I'll start with a story that you may or may not remember, but I first met you when you worked on Capitol Hill. Mm-hmm. You're getting nervous because I'm, I'm going to well, tell you. Well, no, and I remember, but I remember where you're going, so yeah. go ahead. <laughs> you're, you're always going to tell stories about the old days. Yeah. But uh, um, I was working for an organization that was one of the few institutions in Washington, D.C., right of center, mm-hmm. that was opposing a Republican president who wanted to pass this massive bailout of Wall Street. Mm-hmm. It's 2008. Yeah. And, and I, I could name names, but I can tell you that there was virtually no one, libertarian or conservative, inside the Beltway that was willing to stand up against that because it was our guys. Mm-hmm. And that's how I met you, because you were working on Capitol Hill at the time, and and you were working with us to find members that were willing to do the right thing. Um, And there just weren't that many. And the reason I tell that story is that sometimes 
the most difficult thing to do to defend liberty is calling out your own. Mm. It's pretty easy to call out right. Joe Biden. Like right. we, we could do that all day and we get lots of clicks and everybody would be like, yeah. yeah. But calling out your own team like you did with this letter, um, that's where you defend liberty. And, and I spent an entire hour uh, talking to Glenn Beck yesterday and I don't. I think the podcast has probably already been published, and we're kind of calling out our own. Mm -hmm. Like um, nonviolence is an absolute principle. Um, when when I was working with the Tea Party, we studied the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. We studied the very conscious tactics that they chose to not get violent because they wanted to galvanize public opinion. Um, what happened at the Capitol is an abomination not just because it's not who we are, it's because the tactic of violence is now galvanizing the American public away from whatever their cause was. You know, and you raise a lot of different issues there. Um, that wasn't a question, by the well, way. Well, no, but, it, but you, you've, you've touched on a lot of different topics. Yeah. And, you know, one of them is, that's important to talk about is, is the um, temperature and what we experienced on Wednesday. I was on the House chamber, right, when people were banging on the door. I'm, I'm a member of the United States House of Representatives, and there are people banging on the door. And you got to think about that for a moment. Even as we are in the middle of the debate attached to the counting of the electors for the President of the United States, that is an extraordinary moment in our nation's history. Right? And that, that one will be written about and talked about. And I was there. Um, we should not have been in that position. Uh, not we, the members of Congress. We, the nation. Uh, and it is the product of a number of things, but a woman died right off of the House floor. A woman who is a veteran, a 14-year veteran of the United States. I don't know her ideology. There's stories being written about it. I don't know. It's not really the issue right now. She was a woman, an American, who served her country, and whatever led her to that moment trying to crack onto the floor of the house and breaking down glass, she died. A police officer just died last night. And that was formally announced that he passed away from injuries sustained. This is in our capital. This is a moment that we need to use to spring forward, to embrace the principles that unite us together, to move past it and not incite the hatred and the violence against our institutions and our nation. And that that's the path before us. And I believe that we've got that opportunity. I believe that we can use this as a galvanizing moment to remind the American people the very principles that this country have embraced, that the world has looked to and still looks to, are the principles that will carry us forward. Uh, and that we've talked about federalism, we've talked about um, you know our history and our founding, but those are the things that will, that will define us now coming through this and, it, and and as we head towards we're 12 days till the inauguration and i'm going to be admonishing now so you talked about admonishing your own and i did that on wednesday and i'll continue to do that i'm doing it as we speak i keep getting you know pushback i'm also going to admonish my democratic colleagues that they have an obligation to turn down the temperature they have an obligation not to walk in believing there's some massive mandate for them to start pushing their policies and their dreams onto the American people. Yeah. That will do a lot to increase temperature, not decrease it. And we gotta have those conversations. Yeah, and, and the reason I am so adamant about denouncing violence is that I have been denouncing violence um, in the streets of Portland and at protests that um, are very much representing um, progressive interests. And I, I think consistency um, demands that we do that. Um, and that also allows us to point out some of that hypocrisy. I, um, some people are tweeting out pictures of the 2018 Women's March takeover of the Hart Senate office building, I think it was. A thousand women went into the office and, and I, I go into Senate offices and I know you can't just go in. Right. So, so clearly um, they, in some way violated the rules and, and broke through those. Uh, did they all go through metal detectors? I can't imagine they did. Um, and and I, I think 
you know, I sort of like peaceful protest, and I'm not sure that I would have been opposed to that, but it it needs to stay peaceful. The 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 story I told just a minute ago about the Wall Street bailout, mm-hmm. we we actually had a little party above this studio. I don't know if you remember it, but it was I think I called it the End of Freedom Party, mm-hmm. where I gathered everyone in Washington D.C. that had opposed the Wall Street bailout, and it was like a couple dozen people mm-hmm. maybe, and I'm joking but not joking mm-hmm. i think that's what it was right um but those were the seeds for what i view as one of the most impactful and values-based grassroots movement the, the tea party movement mm-hmm. um which which led to a, a revolution we actually had a real impact on on reigning in the growth of spending and and all sorts of things um barack obama apparently in his new book um blames us for stopping his agenda and i'm like well, well thank good you. thank you <laughs> thank you thank you i'm gonna put yeah. that on my on my tombstone yeah. so let's let's talk about what we do to get our mojo back like how do we rein in spending and and frankly i'll, I'll say like republicans have not been helpful like republican speakers your friend justin amash I'm just babbling here, but yeah. your friend Justin Amash showed this this chart of how many amendments uh, Republican speakers allowed, allowed, and it went from like 450 to zero, and then they lost control of the House, and Nancy Pelosi's like, well, hold my beer. Yep. I'm never going to allow a vote again, and now we just vote on one bill a year, and it, it costs trillions of dollars. <clears throat> you know, there, again, there's a lot of different paths we could go down. I, that point is one that I make all the time, and Justin is one of the reasons, and I've gotten, gotten to... Uh, uh, Count Justin among my closer friends in, in Washington, and obviously he's no longer on the Hill, uh, but I don't think he's going to go far away uh, from public policy discourse. And what the American people do not understand is we do not have open debate. We just don't. We don't have the ability to come down and amend. As a member of the United States Congress, I've never had the opportunity in my now two years and change to go to the floor of the House and offer an amendment to a piece of legislation and have it considered. Think about that. Not once. Not once have I been able to get a bill that I just bring down, come down to the bill, and get it heard because I ask to have it heard. Now, I have managed to get legislation through some of the uh, arcane processes, but um, that is fundamental, and that's what's tearing us apart. If you have a massive $2.3 trillion bill, like we just saw get jammed through over the Christmas break, and we never had a chance to debate or amend it, Think about that. that. What is in that bill? Just thousands of pages of programs and bureaucrats and spending and spending dollars we don't have. We didn't break down and say, okay, let's have a debate over $600 checks and $2,000 checks. Let's just have a debate on that. Let's have a debate on PPP extension and funding for small businesses. Let's have a debate on wars and how we're funding them. Let's have a debate on specific uh, programs and whether we're funding education a certain way. We don't do that. They say, oh, don't worry about it. We did it in committees. But it's a bunch of folks in a back room, and they go figure it out in, in a handful of folks, and they come bring it to the floor in a closed rule is what they call it. And then they basically say, here you go, vote. Vote up or down. Now, of course, if I vote no, I'm voting against literally thousands of things people come to know and expect. And if I vote yes, I'm voting for literally thousands of things that I think are unconstitutional, and strike at the heart of the republic and tear us apart. Mm-hmm. That's a broken system that must change. So you ask me, where do we go? This is why when I was on the floor of the House the other day, I looked directly at Steny Hoyer and said, we must debate. And you know it. And I pulled him aside as we were walking off the floor. I said, Steny, you've been here a long time. We have got to get back to being able to debate. We have got to be able to be back on the floor of the House. It's the only way we can open the lid, You know, pull up the veil, on all of this stuff and then have real serious conversations. So I can look at my friend Abigail Spanberger from Virginia, who's a Democrat, or Dean Phillips from Minnesota, look at some of my House Freedom Caucus conservative allies, and we all sit down on the floor and we say, what are we going to cut? What are we going to expand? What are we going to do to not just turn a blind eye, to not just 28 trillion, 30 trillion? I mean, we're stepping on the gas, man. And all of that's funding these various enormous programs. We've got to be able to have debate. We've got to be able to bring that back so the American people can see it. Um, I'm 100% aligned with Justin on that, um, Thomas and others that believe we need to have open debate. So it, it just dawned on me that um, without your ability to offer an amendment, 
the so-called people's house doesn't actually give any vehicle for the people to even express frustration. Like if, if you want to offer an amendment in the House and you're a Republican and you're a constitutional conservative, you're in the minority of the minority, you're probably not going to pass it. But at least there was a vote. At least there was a public debate mm-hmm. about, about views and values that represent your constituents. Well, and you also don't know if you may pass it. Right. There are a lot of things we agree on that we never get a chance to be able to have an actual airing. Right. I was able to get a bill passed on the PPP, a PPP Flexibility Act that was seven pages last summer, last June, when small businesses were dying. And we had passed that Monster Cares Act, which had a lot of stuff in it I did not like. But the PPP uh, bill had some good parts, some bad parts. Big businesses were able to take money they shouldn't have been able to. But we wanted to give flexibility to small businesses who were dying. Literally thousands of small businesses in my district were calling my office thanking us for getting that done. And it was my, it was me and it was Dean Phillips, a freshman Democrat and a freshman Republican. And we essentially took it to the people and had an outside-inside game, as you know, bring pressure from the outside and demanded it. And the speaker looked at it and was like, well, we're going to have to do this. We have no choice. Yeah. But that took my years of experience in this town, working with Dean and finding a path to apply that outside pressure. And you ask what we're going to need to do. We need to take a page out of the 2010-ish playbook. We need to take a page out of how we take information to the people, get behind a set of ideas of things that we can push to change, and then demand they change. And we demand they change peaceably, like we did year after year after year over the last 20 years. If you're in the midst of a sea change, which we are, then we need to embrace that peaceably to make the change. It takes time to reverse the ship. Right? It takes time to get that shift. And we made a lot of inroads in 2010 and 2012 and the Freedom Caucus is born. And we're, we've got voice now to a lot of those concerns that were just happening by process here in this town. The 2000, the bailout, the Wall Street bailout. I was sitting over at the Heritage Foundation with a group of a handful of those people you identified who had been opposing that and fighting it. The vast majority of the people in that room were celebrating its passage after you'll remember we actually killed it on a couple of votes yeah, yeah. and we're applauding killing it and they're all saying this is terrible you're yeah. going to kill the economy and i say no no we're fighting for what's right and what the american people want and they don't want us to, to bail out these too big to fail banks and businesses um and and we were winning we, we won minds and hearts in that effort is what yeah. i'm saying yeah by, by the way the people killed it um yeah and that was the first time I realized that the, the paradigm had shifted mm-hmm. that people now had the tools to express their voice, basically end running the closed system of Congress. That's and right. I think I think that's always gotta be our model. Yep. That's that's but it but again it was it was peaceful and and we stopped it several times only to have the Treasury Department and the Fed do it in in a other radically ways. unconstitutional way. Right. Which, which is why I support auditing the Fed and all the things yeah, that we yeah. need to do and so forth. But yeah. So let's, um, and I, I, I agree with that, that paradigm very much. And it takes people on the inside that are willing to stick their necks out. Right. It's not fun. It's uh, not politically safe to do that. But it's something that has to be done. I think we're about to, speaking of uh, Democrats saying, hold my beer. I feel like they're going to just double down on everything bad. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically, you've been very outspoken against lockdowns, mm-hmm. but, but Joe Biden, in what I thought was a fairly ominous message, he's like, this, this is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Mm-hmm. And I feel like he's paving the way for a, a radical federal expansion of power in a pretense of protecting us from the virus. What do, you, what do you think? What do you think the biggest threats are coming down? Is that is that the one, or is that just what I'm fixated on? I think that is one of several uh, that I think uh, is coming our way. And I'm going to back up for one second to say why uh, those small business shutdowns and lockdowns that are being caused by all levels of government. It's not just the locals, right? It's local, state, and federal. And why federal? Because federal is messaging it and then offering a... There's support. a lot of hectoring from the, the federal bureaucrats uh, like, like Fauci. Correct. And, then, and also with a false notion that the federal government can prop them up and sustain them. And they can't. 
You can't sustain this multi-trillion dollar economy that sustains the world. And by the way, side note, we, 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 we obviously are so much concerned about the you know several hundred thousand people in this country that have been impacted by the virus. You read reports of 150 million people worldwide who might starve because our economy isn't cranking out what it normally would crank out. There are consequences to these decisions. There are consequences to constraining the ability of American people to use their own judgment to make these calls. A business can make a decision about masks. A, a group of people in schools and businesses can make decisions about how to protect themselves. Why? They're self-interested human beings. We do not need the government from Washington throwing out all of these constraints on us to make decisions for our own well-being. And that's what we're seeing. And I just got an email right before we came on here, a local business called Austin Pizza Garden, a few miles from where I live, um, where we used to go all the time, right across the from the baseball fields where my son plays Little League, to go eat pizza, it's shutting down, right? Uh, it was a restaurant, Shady Grove. I went there the day after my wife and I got married, shutting down. Um, I could go after business, after business, after business. Threadgills in South Austin, where my wife and I had a rehearsal dinner, it shut down. Um, and, these, they're, and they're not coming back. They're not coming back. And these are these are institutions that are the fabric of our society. It's where we go to have a beer and come together, um, which is also dividing us further. And that that's shredding who we are as a people, shredding the small businesses that are the backbone of an independent American spirit. Instead, all while enriching the very mega corporations that don't give a rip about your local community and that have nothing to do with that fabric of your community when we talked about yeah. what it is to be Austin, Texas, what it is to be the state of Texas. And Chili survives on the corner and Google and Amazon get great, yeah. but every little local mom and pop shop or business that's been there for 30, 50, 70 years gets shredded. That's what I want to push back against. And, and, and I will be fighting as hard as I can nonviolently, fighting as hard as I can against the incoming administration and or my Republican colleagues that want to continue to perpetuate that. And, and they do so at the peril of stability. And it is important to note that you and I share, and that was the point of what I wanted to do this week with accepting the electors and drop down the rhetoric, a, a belief that we as America must do this peaceably. But they also, uh, we also need to recognize that, that when decisions are made recklessly to drive an enormous agenda without a mandate, there is no mandate right now, then you are going to cause tensions to rise. And this that is a message that I hope my left-leaning friends will listen to and hear. When you come in here on a high horse saying we're going to have, you know, uh, you're going to push D.C. statehood, right? We can agree or disagree on that and have a debate about D.C. statehood, but that's going to elevate the temperature, right? Because now you're saying two new senators. Mm -hmm. You're going to elevate the temperature on perhaps uh, uh, firearms, right? And you're going to have to register your firearms or pay a tax. Well, guess who's going to, uh, out there among firearm owners, is going to say, oh, sure, Uncle Sam, sign me up. I'll come, I'll come fill out that form telling you that I've got this weapon. People are going to say no. And you start breaking down the fabric of the rule of law because you're telling people to do things that are contrary to their own well-being and, you're, and that are contrary to the American spirit. Yeah. So you are a 100% constitutional conservative, but your message sounds like something that I've been characterizing as, as uh, libertarian populism. And it's, it's populism in the sense that I want, I want the people to be involved, but it's based on those principles mm -hmm. of, of localism, bottom up, people helping people, mm -hmm. uh, uh, state and federal authorities staying out of the way. Um, I know Thomas Massey and Justin Amash, Mike Lee, Rand Paul, and others have had a lot of success working across the aisle. You know, uh, I think that the, the establishment would call it strange bedfellows. Thomas right. Massey's working with Tulsi Gabbard. Mm -hmm. um, have you had an opportunity to do that and, and on a what issue? Actually, on a number of different things, and I'm actually delighted to do so uh, because you kind of lay down the, the, the normal sort of structures around here that says you must do this because it's a game of shirts and skins. And you're kind of going, wait a minute. I mean, you know, and, and, and I worked on a piece of legislation um, with my friend Abigail Spanberger from Virginia. Now, you know, people might know I'm a Texan, a proud Texan family goes back to the 1850s, but I actually grew up in Virginia, went to the University of Virginia, lived in Richmond, it was my first job uh, near where Abigail lives now. And she went to the University of Virginia. So we share all that in common. 
So we were working on legislation. I actually had people on my side of the aisle saying, you know, she's going to be in a real tight race. You don't want to give give her air cover to be working with her on something that that uh, might she might be able to use to be able to go run to get reelected. <clears throat> I said, if I can't work with Abigail, if I can't work with Abigail, then who may I work with on the other side of the aisle? Right. It's it. it I'm not saying I don't want a Republican to win the seat or someone that more shares my worldview, of course. But Abigail is a friend and someone that I'm happy to work with. And uh, we've got legislation, for example, that would uh, require members of Congress to put all of their uh, uh, investments into a blind trust uh, to, to try to at least minimize some of the obvious, you know, profiting Self -dealing, some yeah. members of Congress are are. Uh, getting through, um, you know, while they're in office. And I think that we should try to separate that. Uh, and Abigail agrees. So we've got legislation to try to do that. I think that's a good thing. Uh, as I said, I worked with Dean Phillips to pass the PPP Flexibility Act, which was an enormous deal. Seven-page bill passed in the height of tension when they said, no, 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 we got to pass this $2 trillion bill. And we got that done in June in the middle of all of that. And it was an extraordinary achievement. And we got it passed all the way through the House and, and then uh, in the Senate and signed by the President. So there are opportunities to work together. Um, there's a lot that I work on on uh, our entanglements overseas. Um, look, I represent Fort Sam Houston, Army Futures Command, about 80,000 veterans. San, San Antonio is called Military City USA. Uh, we have a lot of strong veterans in the state of Texas. And I'm hawkish when it comes to wanting to defeat bad guys. Uh, very much so, actually. But I am not... Uh, trad yeah, hawkish in the sense of what we currently have today in having 20-year engagements in Iraq, Afghanistan, now Syria, Yemen, all built on an authorization of the use of military force passed in 2001. We will reach the 20th anniversary of that this September. There are men and women in uniform who are, have enlisted and are serving today who were not alive when we passed that authorization of force. Think about that. It's extraordinary. World War II for the United States last about three and a half years. Three and a half years on a two-front war. And we've now been 20 years in, and Congress doesn't have the fortitude to stand up and vote and put its mouth where its money is. Mm -hmm. I think that's extraordinary. And I think these are the kinds of things where Zoe and others on the, on the Democratic side of the aisle, we're having those kinds of conversations. Um, and we should. It's uh, that's that's an issue where conservatives and libertarians and and progressives can very much find common ground. And and I would make sort of the fiscal conservative case for that. I think uh, I think the undoing of all of the fiscal restraint we accomplished during the uh, Tea Party takeover of Congress was undone by Republicans that wanted to give national defense a blank check. And it. It is sort of the, the end of empire sort of argument. Like if you're in Afghanistan for 20 years and you're in all these other places, it makes our men and women in service less safe. It drains our country of, of finances. I mean, that's a huge driver of, of the national debt. So I think that that sort of uh, tripartisan coalition, as Justin Amash would have called it when he was still in Congress, those are the kinds of things we need to focus on because – it's it's the right thing to do from from a, sort of a values base, but just practically speaking, we can't afford it. No, I mean I couldn't agree more. Uh, and you know when I talk to a veteran who has been on six, eight, ten, twelve tours of duty, and when I think that the fraction of the American people who are wearing the uniform, which is less than a half of one percent, uh, and I, I I see the toll that that takes on families. Yeah. That's another aspect of this, right? We are, and look, our men and women in uniform, they, they, they sign up knowing what they're doing, okay? And, and, and many of them love, love it, love what they're doing and, and are, are blessed for doing it. And, and God bless them for it, or for protecting our country. But we're also often asking them to do things over and over and over again in an extended period of time. And you want to talk about some of the issues we now have with respect to mental health, PTSD, the things that are impacting these veterans who have been injured, hurt, but just the, the raw impact on who they are and their psyche. Um, we need to own that as Congress. We need to own it. Got to vote. Go down to the floor of the House of Representatives. Have a debate. 
I might vote for some bill to have presence somewhere for a specific goal. And I'm not going to state what that is or not at this point. I'm just going to say, let's debate it. Come show me, DOD. Come show me, intelligence. Come show me, State Department, why these particular men and women need to be on a base in this location to serve our national security interests. We should vote on that. The, 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 the Constitution is pretty clear, right, about war powers. And we cannot allow this to just continue and have both the budgetary impact and the impact on our men and women in uniform and our uh, foreign policy. Well, you've had maybe an hour of sleep, um, and you didn't actually say anything outrageous. Completely outrageous. Yeah. Well, dang, I haven't done my job then. Yeah. you got to say something outrageous. But I, I really appreciate you joining us, and I, I appreciate what you and, and Massey did to stick your necks out. And uh, um, as the great moral philosopher Jerry Garcia once said, one way or another, this darkness got to give. Amen. As somebody from Austin, Texas that appreciates live music and uh, saw the Grateful Dead at a Willie Nelson July 4th concert, I'm, All uh, right. I appreciate it very much. We got to get some live music. If you want to take the temperature town, we need a little bit of music therapy. Look, I'm serious. I mean, I've actually been able to go to a few live music concerts in Central Texas. I represent Luckenbach and, and Green Hall and downtown yeah. Austin, and it's good for the soul, man. We need it. Terry and I actually traveled to uh, Billy Bob's yes. to see Robert Earl Keane. Oh, Bobby. In November, something like that, and it, it was it was I, much needed. I saw Robert O'Keen at the Nutty Brown Cafe about a mile from my house just uh, last fall, and I took my entire team in the fall in our campaign to go see a number of, of local Texas artists. But Robert Earl's one of my favorites. I love it. Good, good Texas Aggies like my wife is. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty, honest conversations with interesting people.